Osio Nigat, Jennifer Lauren Dogwado. Hello everyone, I'm Jennifer Lauren, Cherokee Nation citizen and host of Osio Voices of the Cherokee People. Welcome to Chalagi, wherever we are. On today's show, we're going to talk about a very popular subject among many Cherokee citizens, genealogy. Genealogy provides us with our ancestral connections, finding out from whom we descended, where our families have traveled and settled over time, and which of them signed the Dawes Commission rolls. That's the federal document which provides proof of our Cherokee citizenship. We'll start today's show with remarks from Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chuck Hoskin Jr. Then I'll explore the topic with Principal Chief Hoskin and Deputy Chief Brian Warner and what it has told them about their ancestors. After that, we will see an OCO TV clip of Grambly Brewer, who's an investigative journalist, as he uncovers his family tree. Then we will welcome David Hampton and Jean Norris, genealogists, to our show, and they'll talk about their passion for exploring and sharing family lineages and what you need to know when looking to explore your family tree. And finally, Senior Manager for Cherokee Nation Collections and Exhibits, Kristen Mosier, will conclude our show. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, Chuck Hoskin Jr., for his remarks. OCO friends and fellow Cherokees, genealogy research holds a profound significance in understanding a person's roots, preserving cultural heritage, and establishing a sense of identity. For Native people, including the Cherokee Nation, genealogy research is even more significant because it is tied to tribal identity. Among the various populations in American history, Cherokee Nation is widely regarded as one of the most well-documented indigenous communities ever, largely due to the Dawes Rolls. The Dawes Rolls, also known as the final roles of citizens and freedmen of the five civilized tribes, was a federal census conducted between 1898 and 1906 to determine citizenship within the Cherokee Nation and other tribal governments. This exhaustive undertaking recorded personal information about Cherokees, including names, family relationships, and the federally determined blood quantum. This document played a pivotal role in tracking Cherokee ancestry historically and continues to inform the tribal government's citizenship policies, reaffirming the connection between genealogy and culture. Today, to be recognized as a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, there must be direct lineage to an individual listed on the Dawes Rolls. Our citizens today, all equal citizens of the Cherokee Nation under the law, trace to that role, whether descending from an original enrollee who was listed as a freedman, a Delaware, a Shawnee, or a Cherokee. The Dawes Roll remains a valuable resource for Cherokee genealogists and descendants seeking to establish their tribal connection. The importance of genealogy research lies in its capacity to unearth one's familial history and heritage. It provides a sense of belonging, a link to the past, and a source of cultural pride. Genealogy in this context is a direct path to citizenship and the preservation of the Cherokee culture. Knowing your genealogy helps us as Cherokees connect with our ancestors, values, and traditions that have helped shape our tribal nation over generations. The Cherokee Nation, with its extensive access to documentation and talented researchers, stands as a resource for our citizens to utilize. Genealogy research is not only a means of tracing Cherokee family history, but also a vital tool for understanding and perpetuating our cultural identity as a people and as a government. Through rigorous citizenship requirements connected to genealogy, Cherokee Nation safeguards our citizens and protects our culture. I hope on today's broadcast we can shine a light on the enduring connection between genealogy, citizenship, and culture within the Cherokee Nation. Wado. Wado, Chief, and thank you very much, Deputy Chief Brian Warner, for joining us here on the couch to talk about genealogy and Cherokee ancestry. Um, so starting with you, Chief Hoskin, what can you tell me, um, what can you tell all of us about 
um, what you know about your Cherokee ancestry and maybe your family story. Well, you know, like many of us, we're just learning over time. My wife, our first lady, did a real deep dive, and then we had some experts at the Cherokee Nation, like David Hampton, do do an even more expansive search. And I've learned a lot, and so I was familiar with some colorful characters in my ancestry, including a gentleman named Ned Hoskin, who, who did a lot, ran a dry goods store in Going Snake. Uh, but even going further back to discover that one of my ancestors was a freed slave prior to that era that we're more familiar with, 1866, freed under the laws of the Cherokee Nation. Of course, there's, there's a great deal more we'd like to know, but from what we know, that's the history. And it just showed me that there's so much to discover and because we're so well documented as uh, native peoples, particularly Cherokees, uh, there's a lot to explore still. And so that was interesting to me. And, and, and the other thing is when you explore your personal genealogy as a Cherokee, you start to feel where your place is, your family's place is in the Cherokee society uh, in the old country before removal. And that makes uh, the larger story of Cherokee history even deeper. So those little interesting facts that I've discovered about myself, including uh, descending from some colorful characters uh, and interesting people, uh, really help me understand our place in history. Some people, um, when you say Cherokees are some of the most well-documented people, um, you know, can you kind of help explain what you mean by that? We all know the, the source uh, of our citizenship is now the Dawes Rolls, that turn of the 20th century uh, census of uh, Cherokees living within the Cherokee Nation. But our documentation goes back even further. I mean, before removal, of course, we had our own newspaper. We were documenting our day-to-day -day lives. We had a relationship with the Moravian missionaries in which they very meticulously documented the day-to-day -day life of their interactions with our people dating back, uh, you know, way before removal. I think we're talking about even into the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully now working with the Moravians, we have translated volumes from an old German dialect to English that we can all, particularly researchers, can explore the day-to-day -day life. And so we have a sense of who was here, uh, who was living in our communities before removal, down to, and in my case, some of the genealogical logical research showed how many peach trees they had, how many farm implements we left behind, and how much our claim was by uh, after removal. All of that is only available today because we were so well documented. And it's just a rich source of information that we can all really look at and explore. Absolutely. Deputy Chief Forner, what do you know about your family tree? Oh, you know, the when I, I, I have an aunt, uh, Carrie Philpot, is my grandfather's sister, and she's kind of the family genealogist. And she used to tell us different things. But when I got to sit down with, with David, uh, you know, we went further, you started bringing up names like Tidwell and Eski and, uh, you know, Shell and Crittenden, you know, the, the, the Shell and the Crittenden, I kind of knew that. But when you, you know, you see individuals that had uh, a, a big family, you know, and that, and that you're largely related to a whole lot of people out there. And when I grew up, I always felt like we were a fairly small family. But since then, uh, trying to figure out, uh, I, every time I go out somewhere and Chief, probably the same way for mm -hmm. you, uh, mm -hmm. I run into new cousins, oh, you know, right. and, and <laughs> yeah. they, they start throwing names at me. And, uh, so yeah. it's very interesting, but you know, one of the very interesting pieces to me has always been uh, when I finally got to, you know, growing up, I knew Stanley Joe Crittenden, former Deputy Chief, now Secretary of Veterans Affairs. And when you look back at our history, uh, S. Joe and I uh, and our family, um, his grandfather and my great grandmother were brother and sister, but those two brothers and sisters married a Warner brother and sister. So we are related on both sides of that of that aisle, and, and it's very interesting to uh, understand because you know people will talk different things. Hey, did you know this person or that one? And, and it was just recently I was at a Sequoia football game. Uh, it was actually the homecoming, and I had a lady. Uh, she kind of hollered down at me, and, and we got to talk, and she said, "Hey, we're related. I'm going to send you all these names and." These names that she sent me uh, uh, was, you know, I knew them as Aunt Cora because that's how my grandfather talked about her. But that was it was Cora, you know, uh, Critton and Coon. And, you know, there was just so many different little pieces, uh, very in all those names that she listed when she sent me that text. Uh, it took me right back to uh, sitting down and listening to my grandfather on the on the bench in between, a t after eating a bologna sandwich, after working the horses all morning. So I think uh, family history is something that is very important. And uh, I always want to encourage everybody to get down in there, dig and, and find those, like Chief said, there's some interesting characters that are out there and, and it takes you through that history. And 
and for me too to understand a little bit more of Cherokee history and our influence during the times before Civil War and after the Civil War and seeing the devastation that came and how some people came and left, you know, left out here, but then came back afterwards. So uh, very interesting to say the least. Yeah, it's fun to try and imagine when you see the your ancestors documented, trying to imagine what their life was like at that time with the information that you have. You bet. Yeah. Yes. So Chief Hoskin, um, didn't I hear that you found some variations in your last name? I know that people like to add S to Hoskins, yeah. so. Well, it's, it's become a running uh, joke that uh, S on the end of my name, and we have fun with it all the time, Hoskins. The name is Hoskin. But as I go through the genealogy that uh, my wife and David Hampton and others have done for me, Hoskins with an S goes way back. Now, I can tell you the, the short story is, the furthest I can go back is a gentleman named William Wasp early in the uh, 19th century. Uh, but further on, at some point, a Lieutenant Hoskin, who fairly prominent uh, American military man, uh, was in my family. This is a non-Indian, uh, and it's part of my ancestry. So that's where the Hoskin comes from. Later, an S was put on. Around the time of the Civil War, it was changed to Horseskin. Okay, so Horseskin, and the gentleman I mentioned a while ago, Ned Hoskin, his dry goods store was Ned Horseskin Dry Goods Store in Going Snake. That was dropped. Uh, it became a mixture of Hoskin and Hoskins, but I'm going to set the record straight. Forever, it's Hoskin, and I'm sure that won't stick, but that's just some of the fun we have with it. You so. heard it here. Okay. Well, just to wrap up, I mean, you know, why is it important to know these things about our family history? I, I, just sitting here listening to Deputy talk about how personal it is to him, and it, and it connects him to people he's known for a while, and it makes those relationships we have now even more meaningful. But I just think it gives us all a deeper sense of something particularly important among Cherokees. We descend from a common people that had common bonds, familial bonds, cultural bonds, residency, geographic bonds, cultural bonds. I mean, all of those things become so much deeper when you know where you individually came from. And there's some people that can't trace back very far, but I think we can all trace back quite a ways. And it makes those really powerful, sometimes dark, sometimes triumphant moments in Cherokee history, whether it's resisting removal, removal, rebuilding, enduring the American Civil War and trying to rebuild again. It makes all of that so much more personal. And that's what we need. Uh, because when we do that, we start to take, I think, more pride in where we come from. And it starts to make us think about where we're heading because we know so much more deeply on a personal level where we came from. Well, and Chief, too, in today's time, people are searching uh, for identity and who they are and who they really are and, and, and reaching back into those recesses of time. I think that helps give people that sense of, of belonging and, and that balance that we talk about within our culture. Uh, so I think it's of the utmost importance. And, you know, in today's mental health uh, crisis, when you talk about all the different things of this world, taking that time to step back in time and then being able to find relationships out there that are meaningful with others, uh, it, it helps to, uh, it helps, it's good business. Uh, it's good, it's, it's good, uh, it's good to just know that you are a part of something that's larger than just uh, what you see on TV and everything in, in these days and times. So uh, I can't tell anyone how important it is to, to get out there and to, you know, dig deep. And, and there's so many different things, but you really want to uh, have people that are the, you know, that are experts in this, like Gene Norris, like David Hampton yeah. and others. I know hundreds of other individuals that are genealogists that, that do such great work because it kind of, it validates uh, certain things for you. So I encourage anyone to get out there, uh, whether they're just beginning or whether they're a seasoned veteran of genealogy, just get out there and keep continuing. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. We appreciate it. What else? Okay, now let's take a look at Cherokee Nation citizen and NBC investigative reporter Graham Lee Brewer as he discovers his fascinating family tree. Take a look. Just learning what, what time my family decided to, to remove, I think will tell me a lot about them. Were they one of the early ones that decided to leave before they were forced? Um, you know, what, what did they do for a living and what kind of people were they? And a part of the reason I'm out here is because I want, I want to bring people into this whole experience with me, um, my readers at the paper. Um, and I'm kind of hoping through that that people will gain an understanding of how easy it is for them to learn about their own 
past and show them that um, it is worthwhile and it can show them something about who they are. This is the Cherokee Family Research Room or Center and this is Ashley Van. That's the first Van. She's an associate genealogist that works with me. Hello, how are you? Welcome to the Cherokee Family Research yes. Center. Yes, thanks for having me. This is what we put together for you. Uh, you had sent us some basic information uh, about Viola Sweetwater. Uh, your ancestor, your great grandmother, and about your mom, and so we just kind of took, took a little bit of tidbit, tidbits of information that you gave us and went from there. Okay. I know you grew up and knew who your great grandmother was, and you were uh, young when she uh, when she died in 1992. Mm -hmm. This is what's called a birth affidavit, and it shows that she was born 3rd of October, 1899, and that she was born. To, her father's name was William Sweetwater, and her mother was listed as Euphemie Sweetwater. Mm, that these are all. New to These you. are all new to me. The next part we're going to get into is William Sweetwater. Okay. And that is your direct Cherokee ancestor. That is Viola's father. I had always heard from my mom that her great-grandfather or someone was born during the removal process on the way here. They did come on the removal. They did come on the trailer. So they were not considered what were referred to as old settlers. And that was a group of Cherokee that migrated previous to removal. We do know they took the northern route, though. Oh, okay. It certainly makes my life seem a lot easier than uh, I might perceive it to be when you consider the fact that he survived or was at least born on, during mm -hmm. forcible removal. That clip was taken from Graham's story on OCO TV. And remember, you can watch his entire segment and many more Cherokee documentaries on our website, free of charge and at your convenience at OCO.TV. Now I'm pleased to welcome David Hampton and Jean Norris, genealogists extraordinaire, to our set today. Wado, gentlemen, for joining us today. Um, we want to talk essentially about your life's work of figuratively digging up people's relatives, finding connections to their Cherokee ancestors. So I really want this to be like more of a conversation. So feel free to discuss the questions, ask each other questions. Um, first things first, when did you begin working on genealogy and what initially motivated you to pursue it? We'll start with you. I started uh, in 1961 when I was 11. And I think I had had an interest in history before that. And genealogy and history, of course, go hand in hand. And uh, when I first started, I had uh, two, I, I had two great grandparents living at that time and a sister of a great, great grandfather living. And of course, all four of my grandparents lived until I was 36. I feel very lucky that I knew well all of my grandparents. Absolutely. I hear stories from people who didn't even know some of their grandparents. It's hard for me to imagine. And I think that started me with an interest in genealogy, just knowing so many older people in my family. Yeah, how about you, Jean? Well, I grew up around my father's family, and so I can vaguely remember my great-grandmother. She died when I was seven. I think what started me was, as kind of with David, it was a keen interest in history. Uh, and when I was in the fifth grade, our school teacher would read to us after lunch, and he'd pick some historical background books to read out loud to us, and the history just fascinated me, you know, traveling in covered wagons and all those types of things. And then once I hit college, uh, in my second year of college, that's when the genealogy bug bit me. And of course, like, as David, I had many living older relatives then at that time that were able to help me out and point me in the right direction to get started. So, uh, and then uh, of course, cut back later to 1994, and that's when I started researching Cherokee related records when I met Roy Hamilton and we began to delve into his family genealogy and the Christie family, uh, the late Roy Hamilton. <laughs> And uh, I got interested in it. It was hoping a whole new world for me when I started researching those types of records associated with the Cherokee. Uh, Part of that's what you know, we all focused on. And so here we are, and now I'm 20 years now working with the Cherokee Heritage Center, <coughs> excuse me, and the Cherokee National Research Center. Uh, and so I just, you know, I love it. It's just my passion, so. And so over the years, you know, genealogy has evolved and the way in which we do research has evolved. Has, um, has your motivation for being genealogist evolved? Has it changed? Is it still the same type of motivation? I think it's basically the same motivation, but it's so much different researching today than it used to be 60 years ago. I mean, back then, for the first five or so years that I did it, everything was writing letters. And then, and to go to a, a courthouse or a library and do research was was very sel seldom could I do that as a child. 
but then I started, uh, when I went in the Army, I was stationed in Washington, D.C. I was able to visit the National Archives a lot. And I got a lot of genealogy research done there while during the year I was stationed there. And 1986 was when I got my first computer. And then not long after that, the internet came along. And that's developed a whole new world of Cherokee and, and genealogy research. A whole new world. Yeah. Okay. I totally agree with that. It was the same way with me. Yeah. I started out the old fashioned way. Yeah. Waiting for a letter to come in the mail with a big packet of envelope with a big packet of information in it. So now I just get online and I don't have to go to travel to Oregon to get a picture of a headstone. I can just get on find a grave and there it is. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you all are experts at knowing where to find all of those little pieces of information to put that's a whole part story of the, together. That's part of the, uh, the problem people have. If they haven't grown up with seeing how genealogy evolved over years and years, it's hard to think of where might I start looking online? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you know your family's from a particular area, you could just go there and start looking for information in the courthouse. But nowadays, there's so many places online, you don't really know where you're gonna find it unless you're very familiar with the records and how they've grown up over the years. Absolutely. So this next question pertains to a couple of touchy subjects, if you will. Um, so I wanna go ahead and dive in. I'm sure you'll both want to clarify with our viewers anyways, Ancestry.com and DNA testing um, and how people might try to use that as proof of Cherokee lineage. Uh, Cherokee lineage. So Gene, we'll hear from you first on this. Yes, a lot of people, I don't know if it's when the Ancestry.com had their show, Who Do You Think You Are? And they did a lot of studies there and then they started their DNA kit system. Um, I, of course, as we know, DNA is not used for tribal recognition uh, at all. Uh, for citizenship. And so when people are getting their DNA done, it's very uh, general, a general category, like indigenous North American, but it will not say specifically what tribal affiliation. Hence, that's why it's not a good source for that, to do that. Uh, the other thing over that I have found in requests that we get on a daily basis is that when someone has done their DNA through Ancestry, they can link themselves to other relatives, which is a good thing, but some of their relatives have done their genealogy and they've mistakenly connected themselves to someone with a Cherokee background without documentative proof. And then when somebody gets their DNA and they're in the same DNA as that person, they see their research and so they automatically make that mistake and think that is their direct ancestor. Uh, I've gotten them that think they go back to Oconestota and those old, you know, long ago Cherokee leaders. Uh, and there's, you know, very, you know, not be able to do that even with DNA, you know, at all. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a little bit misleading about DNA. Yeah, okay. I, th I think DNA is the future of genealogy as far as determining relationships with people. And, but of course, it's not really relevant toward enrollment in the Cherokee Nation. And it, it doesn't appear to me that right now they can tell e even remotely what tribe a person is from. They may be able to tell that you have indigenous ancestry, but it could develop in the future as they get more and more people doing DNA tests that they'll be able to, to document what tribe's particular DNA, DNA was in. But right now, that's not even a, a good way to go, I don't think. Okay. So Cherokee genealogical provenance is crucial to obtaining citizenship to our federally recognized tribe. So what do interested parties need to do in order to track down their Cherokee nation lineages lineage, I can't say this word, lineage, at least to the Dawes rolls. Would they, would, would they come to either of you? Are there classes? How does this work? They, they could find things online. They would have to, you have to start with what you know and work backwards. Don't go back to somebody on the Dawes roll and say, oh, I think I have ancestor with that name. You start with your parents, your grandparents. When I started doing genealogy, there were literally thousands of persons who were Dawes enrolled that were still living at that time. Over the years, they've, they've died off until 2012, the last original Dawes enrollee of the Cherokee Nation died. But most families even today, I think recognize that they do have a Dawes ancestor because they've had allotments in their land or whatever. There are some who probably have lost that information in their family, but I think a lot of them know if, if you're not really sure that whether you have a Dawes ancestor, it, I would just start 
tracing back each line, parent, grandparent, great-grandparent. For most people today, probably you would need to go back to a great-great-grandparent mm -hmm. to find someone on the DAWs roll. Uh, but just because you found someone with the that person's name on the DAWs roll doesn't mean that's necessarily the same person. Mm -hmm. So families that are looking for those um, names that maybe didn't grow up in a close, tight-knit household, um, I would just, a lot of times people kept the family tree in the old family Bible or something like that. Um, do you have any, um, they absolutely have to have that connection though to the, someone on the Dawes. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of people out there real, or know that the records associated with the Cherokee that we use for genealogy, such as the Dawes final role, were based on their residency within the jurisdictional area of where the Cherokee nation or the Cherokee were located specific to that specific document associated with them, uh, like the Baker Roll in the Eastern Band of Cherokee in North Carolina, uh, and the records that are here that were done after the 1835 Cherokee Nation census the federal government did, uh, like the Drennan, Old Settler, Chapman, Siler, they were done in specific areas where specific Cher pockets of Cherokee were still specifically located. Uh, and like David was saying, somebody will see a similar name on the Dolls Roll and think that's their ancestor. But one of the three things that I talk to folks when they come to us at the Net Trigger National Research Center is it's based on where someone's ancestors lived geographically, when they lived there, what time period, and how were they identifying or being identified by themselves or outsiders. Uh, because there's no such thing as a correct, concise, complete record associated with what we do in genealogy. There's always going to be a misspelling. There's always going to be a date off a year or two or a day off a month. And all those things come into play. But like with the Dawes final role, its basis was specifically because of the land allotment process, as David mentioned, and they had to have proof of residency here in the Cherokee Nation uh, to be on that Dawes final role. Uh, and so at the, Heritage, at the Research Center, the Research Center, uh, we have folks in. I'm actually doing a class tomorrow on how to organize your Cherokee like records that you compile. Oh, nice. We get so many people that come in and they uh, will have a big manila envelope stuffed full and they're like thumbing through it all. And so I'm going to show them how to put them in plastic pages, you know, acetate free plastic pages and all that kind of thing to organize their genealogy because I know I do and I know David does. And so a lot of people just don't organize their genealogy. So uh, we're having a class on that. And of course we do ha do research uh, at the Trigger National Research Center. Uh, we have a form that a person can fill out. They can get on, uh, which Kristen, I mean, that we can talk about later, uh, but it's a form they can fill out with a chart on it and they can send that to us and we'll do a basic search for them at the research One center. of the misconceptions I think that people have is that there are a lot of Cherokees who could have been on the Dawes roll, but were not. Yes. And my experience is that that's almost non-existent. That people who, the DOS Commission went to a great effort to track down people who were citizens and residents of the Cherokee Nation, which were both requirements to be on the DOS roll. And they used previous uh, censuses and roles that the Cherokees had made and tracked down the those people, whether they were still living, and if they were still living, then they made sure they got enrolled, even if they had to, in effect, forcibly enroll them, getting information from their relatives and their neighbors. As far as adults who could have been enrolled, I only really know of two adults who could have been enrolled by Dawes, but were not. Wow. And that's a very small number than what you hear from the stories of people, oh, that um, our ancestors didn't want to be native or they hid in the hills or stories like that. Those are, those are always false. Yeah. So there are probably people out there watching who have a story like that. And I think maybe it's key to know that um, there is a way to find out if it's true or not. And that would be to hire someone or to really dig into the genealogy, correct? Yes. Yeah. So how do people do that? It just what website can they start at, you know, as far as the research center? Well, most of the records that are related to the Cherokee were either federal government records or the Cherokee Nation's own tribal records with the district courts. Uh, as we know, the, the, the district court records are originals are down in Oklahoma City at the Oklahoma History Center in their archives collections. And then, of course, the federal government are in record group 75 in, in D.C. primarily. Uh, a lot of the removal-related records are in different locations. As John Ross was superintendent of the removal, the trail, what's called the Trail of Tears. Uh, so, it's, it's, but most of those that were later microfilmed are now digitized. And so, basically, what we use at the research center is basically just the web. We use the web to search 
We can get images, other DAWs and stuff. I think if I were going to start, I would prepare myself a pedigree chart of my ancestors who I, and specifically look at the ones I thought might be Cherokee and see where they were living in the 1900 yeah. time frame. Because the DAWs rolls were made but for the most part between 1900 and 1906. Mm -hmm. And uh, if your ancestors were not living in the Cherokee Nation, then almost certainly they're not going to be on the Dawes Row. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. and, and also, too, is that, like people don't realize, the general public doesn't realize that of the, all the names of each group, family group and, and those that were not family but single people that are on the Dawes final roll, the majority of them are under the age of 21. So that, and David may cooperate or not, you know, on me on this, but I believe that most Cherokee citizens today document themselves back to somebody born between 1880 to 1906. They don't document back to somebody born in 1742 or 1712. And that's why a lot of people out in the general public have a misconception about it, I think. Yeah, okay. All right, well, thank you very much for all of your time. Is there anything else that you all would like to add at this point? We appreciate you yeah, having us Thank on. you very much. Yeah. Well, we are, we're super appreciative of you uh, coming on and sharing this uh, vital work you provide in order to maintain the strength of our ancestors. I'm sure it's way more difficult and arduous than what you're leading on, as indicated today. But when I hear you, you know, cite all of those resources, I think, I just want to, I just want to pick up the phone and call you and say, here's my information. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so we, we appreciate it so much. Right. Well, no. And now we welcome Kristen Mosier, Senior Manager for Cherokee Nation Collections and Exhibits, for a closing message. OCO and Wado for watching today's show. Someone once said, what's past is prologue. This means the importance of our history sets the context for our present. Many people embark on genealogical journeys to find out about their roots. Connection to our pasts and to our ancestors provides the foundation for understanding our culture and how or why it changed over time. Learning more about our ancestors helps us understand more about the challenges they faced and how those challenges may still affect us today. For the Cherokee people, challenges such as colonization, forced removal, allotment, and cultural assimilation still resonate today. Many people believe that trauma can be passed from one generation to the next, but I believe that triumph can be too. The Cherokee people are a resilient people, and learning your connection to that legacy of resiliency can be very powerful. In a world where many people claim tribal ancestry based solely on family lore or misguided DNA analysis, the quality of your genealogical research can have very real implications. The quality of someone's research can determine whether or not citizenship is attained. This is especially true for descendants of Cherokee Nation and other tribes who rely on this research to determine citizenship. To qualify for citizenship in Cherokee Nation, you must demonstrate direct lineal descent to an original approved Dawes enrollee, this means that you are able to trace your bloodline through verifiable documentation directly to a Cherokee Nation citizen who was approved or verified by the Dawes Commission during the allotment process in the early 1900s. The Cherokee National Research Center has two full-time genealogists with years of experience conducting genealogical research, specifically with Cherokee Nation's rich history. Cherokee Nation is one of the most documented Native American tribes with over 200 years of written and recorded history. You can find genealogy and research request documents at www.visitcherokeenation.com or at the Cherokee National Research Center located at 3377 Cherokee Springs Road in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. The Research Center is open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Our genealogy services are free to the public but do require a scheduled appointment. Wado. Wado, Kristen. Tommy Wildcat will play us out, but first, there is no Cherokee word for goodbye. We say, Dota Doggle, haunt ye, until we see each other again. Wado.
Go, Dago, Herr, the God, and the Yahweh.